I continue to read the biography for Isaiah Berlin. This is、uh, Chapter Nine: Isaiah's War, Washington, 1942 to 1945. This will be the third part of this、uh, chapter, which is quite long. In the last、uh, part, we read that、uh, Isaiah's family got、uh, a postcard from uh, uh, Isaiah's maternal grandfather in 1940. That was the last time they heard from him, or from、uh, any relatives back in、uh, Russia. But these、um, uh, Jewish family were then exterminated by German troops.、Uh, that uh, was uh, the history. So I continue from there. It was the last communication they were to have with their Riga. Family, in July 1941, the German army drove out the retreating Russians, and behind them came the SS. In November and December 1941, the Jews of Riga were rounded up, rounded up by Latvian fascists and the German police, and taken to sandy pits on the outskirts of the city, where. They were shot, and their bodies thrown into a mass grave. The Wasnoks and、uh, Shunistans of Riga, including Isaiah's maternal and paternal grandfathers, perished in this manner. He was not to learn their fate until the end of the war. Their extermination was a fact. He was prepared to mention, but never to discuss. Nor did he write directly about the Holocaust in his、uh, later work. It was、uh, Stalin's crimes, not Hitler's, the, that roused his most intense imaginative response. This curious fact about him is more easily stated than explained. When asked. He would only say that、uh, he never had anything to say about the Holocaust that others had not said. He actively despised the Holocaust industry, and kept his、uh, distance from all rhetorical invocations of his、uh, people's horrible fate. Silence seemed more truthful. But the experience of wartime Washington. Did bring home to him the drastic limits of、uh, his and Wiseman's liberal gradualism. He was、uh, shocked when the Jewish underground resumed its campaign of、uh, active resistance against British rule. In late 1944, the Stern gang assassinated the head of the British military authority, Lord Morney. One of Berlin's colleagues at the embassy, David Ditches, a Scottish literary academic who happened also to be Jewish, remembered that Berlin took him aside after Manny's death and whispered, "We shall have to think like a Swiss, presumably meaning that with their own people." Locked in a death struggle with the British, as、uh, British Jews, they would have to remain neutral. Everything in Berlin led him to、uh, detest Zionist terrorism. The way forward was Westman's way: discreet lobbying behind the scenes. Yet in the end, it was not Westman's、uh, maneuverings. But the physical sight of the dead and the dying in the camps, the photographs and the films of the skeletons and the emaciated corpses, the children with the swollen bellies and the pitiful heaps of broken human possessions, which made the Zionist case suddenly irresistible. Quote, A vast wave of horror. And、uh, compassion and outraged human feelings spread over the earth. End quote. Added、uh, to this, 
The 1945 Labour government's、uh, resistance to Zionism, the resulting spiral of、uh, Jewish terrorism, and President Truman's unexpectedly determined support for a Jewish state, all these factors, entirely unforeseen at the time, produced a result that a lifetime of a、uh, wise man at quite. Diplomacy on its own might never have achieved. Isaiah never repented of his support for Westman, but he true, but he ruefully concluded that、uh, both he and Westman, the men of the center, had written on water, had built on shifting sands. Washington taught him that even great political figures. Rarely understood the history they were trying to shape to their own design, and that politics always had a potential for tragedy, because the forces it sought to master were never fully within human grasp. One could get the impression that he did little else in Washington other than report to Jewish matters. Palestinian actually occupied only a small part of his time, and an even smaller portion of his、uh, weekly summaries. As、uh, Isaiah took a positive、uh, pleasure in pointing in pointing out to Zionist、uh, friends, for someone like、uh, Halifax, the future of、uh, Palestine was a marginal distraction. The bulk of Isaiah's work was, in fact, taken up reporting every nuance of the president's relation with Congress, every manifestation of anti-British feeling among the unions, the newspaper columnists, and the Irish, Indian, Czech, and the Polish minority groups in the American melting pot. These summaries. Attracted a growing following within Whitehall. In January 1944, after a particularly informative cable, Churchill sent Eden, sent Eden, a note asking who actually wrote the summaries that went out under Halifax name. Churchill, who loathed Halifax, Was、uh, certain that such vivid dispatches couldn't have、uh, issued from such a, a pallid pen. The Foreign Office response that came across Churchill's desk a few days later described the author as a Mr. Berlin of Baltic Jewish extraction, by profession a philosopher. That's、uh, what they said about him. On. Twenty seventh January nineteen forty four, Churchill wrote to Eden, "The summaries are certainly well written. I have a feeling that they make the most of everything and present a somewhat perfervid picture of American affairs." Eden commented in his own hand, "I agree. There is a perhaps a too generous Oriental flavor." By perfervid, Churchill meant ardent, close to feverish. By Oriental, Eden meant over subtle, over coloured, un-English. The Baltic Jewish philosopher was undoubtedly clever, but he was not one of us. Nevertheless, the effect on Isaiah's、uh, prestige was immediate. It was not every day that a prime minister and a foreign secretary vied with each other to find the right adjective to categorize a junior official's reports. Isaiah himself met Churchill only once, six months earlier, in late August 1943. He was asked to take a confidential cable to the White House. Where the prime minister was、uh, staying after the summit meeting in Quebec, uh, 
Isaiah was uh, shown up to Churchill's bedroom and was uh, waiting, telegram in hand, when the Prime Minister, fresh from the bath, appeared dressed in his uh, navy blue siren suit. He shook Isaiah's hand, took the telegram, and said, with great vigor and emphasis, Splendid! Good work! Carry on! And then dismissed him with a benevolent wave. Isaiah went out into the night, buoyed up by the old man's capacity to cheer on the forces of life, but also aware that Churchill had no idea who he was. In early February 1944, Clementine Churchill informed her husband that Irving Berlin was in London and asked if he could be find time to thank him for his war work. Mrs. Churchill envisaged a brief handshake. On the contrary, the Prime Minister said he must come to lunch. Rather mystified, Mrs. Churchill saw to it that Mr. Berlin was invited to a luncheon party on 9 February in the garden room at 10 Downing Street, a little dining room directly beneath the cabinet room. The guests include Sir Alan Brooke, commander of the Imperial General Staff and the Duchess of Buckluck, Molly Lassalle, Churchill's secretary, Jock Cowell, recorded what happened. Berlin said little during the meal while Cowell's mother, who thought he might be some kind of a civil servant, kept trying to engage him on the subject of British social problems. At the head of the table, Churchill kept up a steady stream of talk about the war situation. At the end of lunch, Churchill turned and said, Now, Mr. Berlin, tell us uh, what, in your opinion, is the likelihood of uh, my dear friend, the president, being re-elected for a fourth term. Berlin, who spoke in a heavy Brooklyn accent, said uh, he felt sure that uh, Roosevelt's great name would ensure him victory. He added uh, for good measure. But if he won't stand again, I don't think I will vote at all. You mean, asked Churchill, that you think you will have a vote? I I sincerely hope so. Churchill muttered that it was a good sign of Anglo-American cooperation if the professor had a vote in America. Churchill's subsequent questions about the state and volume of war production in the States elicited only vague and non-committed replies. Churchill, growing exasperated, asked Berlin when he thought the war would end. Mr. Prime Minister, I shall tell my children and grandchildren that Winston Churchill asked me that question. By now thoroughly confused, Churchill asked what was the most important during that Mr. Berlin had written? He replied, White Christmas. Sensing social disaster, Clementine Churchill said gently that they should all be grateful to Mr. Berlin because um, he had been so generous. Generous, her husband growled, looking about him in consternation. By this time, Jock Cowell was uh, gently kicking the Prime Minister under the table. What are you kicking me for? Churchill growled, and then turned his back on Berlin. Shortly thereafter, the lunch broke up. Berlin returned to the hotel where he was uh, staying with the producer Alexander Koda. He reported that uh, it had been a puzzling lunch. He did not exactly seem to hit it off with the Prime Minister. Jock Cowell then broke the case of a mistaken identity to the Prime Minister and 
a much amused Churchill told the cabinet. Soon the story was、uh, circulating in Whitehall, and、uh, from there it asked it leaked into the press, appearing in Time magazine in April 1944. Isaiah was in London at the time, and having heard the story from Lock,、uh, from Jock Carwell, realized that he had become a, a minor celebrity by mistake. The Irving Winston Isaiah affair was、uh, going the rounds in London. Lord、uh, Beaverbrook ran up to ask Isaiah to dinner and to offer him a column on his、uh, newspapers. Formerly Saint Office, also Grandis now sought his opinion. Whitehall colleagues. Wrote to him to say that his Washington dispatches echoed the、uh, achievements of、uh, the great memoir memoirists and diarists of the past. Creevy, Saint Simon, Clarendon, and、uh, Grewell. His own chief, Lord Halifax, was、uh, heard. Delightedly shopping the story of the two Berlins around、uh, Washington. In November 1944, Isaiah was on such good terms with his boss that Halifax invited him to listen to the results of the presidential election contest between Roosevelt and Dewey on the radio in his、uh, private apartment at the embassy. He joined a select party that included Lord Cairns, his、uh, Russian wife Lydia Lopakova, and the Queen's brother David Bowie's Lynn. Berlin's only previous meeting with、uh, Monarch Cairns at a King's dinner in 1935 had not been a success. He had come to read a philosophical paper. On pleasure, and when Keynes,、uh, who was、uh, seated beside him at a high table, learned what the subject was, he said、uh, cuttingly、uh, that he might as well be giving a paper about the soup they were being served. When he next met in Washington. The atmosphere was、uh, different. Berlin was introduced to Keynes as a professor. Berlin, and then he firmly said he was not a professor. Keynes replied that he wasn't either, adding, "I reject indignity without the emolument." Over dinner at、uh, the Halifax, Isaiah chattered away to Lady Keynes in Russian, to Lord. Kain's mild but evident displeasure. After dinner, they all repaired to Halifax's、uh, study upstairs. As the expert on American politics, Isaiah was、uh, dis- uh, deputed to bring with him the Washington Post map of the electoral districts and to mark off the results as the radio announcers read them out. The radio droned on: Mississippi, four ninety districts for Roosevelt, ten for Dewey. Lydia Kynes grew bored and began chattering away to Isaiah in heavy accented, accented, accented English. Do you like Roosevelt? People like him very much, Rosie. I like Rosie very much. Minard interjected. Not now, Lydia. Not now. Another half an hour passed. Lydia then asked Isaiah, "Do you like Lord Halifax?" Halifax Fax was sitting on a adjacent couch. She said, "You know he's quite popular now, but it was not always so. Do you remember appeasement? It was terrible. Munich appeasement. It was terrible." Isaiah managed to muffle. A snort of a laughter, and even Menard did not interrupt her this time. Clearly, 
enjoying the mischief. The pallid host, Lord Halifax, looked down at his feet and patted his dog. No, no, Frankie, he said to the dog. Enough of this politics. He led the dog away and phoned Roosevelt's right-hand man, uh, Harry Hopkins. Halifax came back and said, "I have talked to Harry, and he says it is in the bag." After that, the party broke up. Whenever Keynes was in Washington, he and Berlin would meet. Sometimes、uh, at、uh, Robert Brand's or at the embassy itself, Isaiah richly enjoyed the great man's company, though occasionally Keynes' provocative insouciance, insouciance, I n s o u c i a n c, I don't know what is it, insouciance shocked him. Once during a hot summer's dinner in 1944, Keynes. Asked, "Have you ever noticed that Congress passed a idiotic legislation in July and August? It is far too hot, much too hot for a white man. For white men, all right for niggers. No good for the likes of me." Berlin also remained dubious about Keynes' grasp of American politics. He seemed to think that the dispatch of some appropriate London Times editorial to the office of a recalcitrant Southern senator would bring him round to appropriately enlightened views. Would this make a difference? He would ask Isaiah. None whatever, Isaiah replied. But he. Strongly approved of Keynes, the liberal internationalist, his、uh, Keynesian colors show through in a commentary on Frederick Hayek's *The Road to Serfdom*, a work published in 1944 and immediately taken up by Wall Street Republicans in their battle against Keynes's Bretton Woods scheme. Which, to the consternation of、uh, ideological free marketer marketeers, sought to bring stability to international currencies through central bank regulation. Wall Street looks to Hayek as the richest gold mine yet discovered, and are、uh, peddling his views everywhere. Isaiah sardonically concluded. In their battle against such sinister social incendiaries as Lord Keynes and the British Treasury, another episode from 1944 that cast a light on Isaiah's politics was a memorable duel with、uh, Donald Maclean, then a colleague at the British Embassy and、uh, unbeknownst to Isaiah, a Soviet agent. One day, McLean put his、uh, head round the door of Isaiah's office and said, "I work with the、uh, Pentagon and State Department people. They are all so pompous. I hear you know some new dealers. Could you invite some?" Isaiah, who had Oxford friends in a common, in common with、uh, McLean, agreed, and got a K. Green、uh, Graham. To arrange a dinner of、uh, young officials, including Ed、uh, Pritchard. Pritchard. Over dinner, Isaiah remarked in passing that he knew Alice Roosevelt,、uh, Longworth, a、uh, cousin of the president, a grandee dame, famous in Washington for her anti-New Deal opinions. Maclean, who had been drinking heavily, suddenly paused. She is a horrible woman with horrible views. When Isaiah replied that he didn't see why he shouldn't spend time with the people who had horrible views, Maclean angrily replied, "I don't say you shouldn't see her. What I mean is that you should not 
have the kind of a taste that would make you want to see her. Seeing Mrs. Longworth hardly proved that he had a reactionary taste. Isaiah responded, "I won't say that、uh, at the twelfth hour you won't be on our side." McLean continued, "But until then, you hunt with the hare and with the horns." At this point, to Isaiah's astonishment, since he had first met Mr. Longworth at her father's house, K. Graham waited. In on McLean's side, the room was、uh, dividing rapidly into two camps, and Isaiah felt that he was in a Douglas Fairbanks film, where the hero has to jump onto the table to parry with a single rapier, the thrusts of a hundred blades. It was a, a comic way of、uh, seeing things. But the argument was quite serious. Everyone was accusing him of siding with、uh, uh, arch enemies of a progressive folk everywhere. We are supposed to be fighting for civilization, civilization against、uh, barbarians, Isaiah remembers saying, with a sententiousness unusual for him. Civilization means you are free to choose your friends. McLean would have none of this, and insisted that life was a war. In war, you had to know which side you were on. The rest of the room, K. Graham included, noisily concurred. Isaiah remained adamant. I can see that you should be judged by your friends. That I concede. He was、uh, even prepared to envisage extreme situations in which one might have to sacrifice friends who had betrayed some essential trust or some、uh, righteous cause. But until then, you must be allowed to know him, even if、uh, people condemn you for it. McLean would not let the matter rest. Life is a battle, he repeated. We should know what side we are on. And not having dealings with the other side, the evening broke up in acrimony, with、uh, McLean tottering out into the garden to relieve himself. There were repertory phone calls from、uh, K. Graham, and a letter from McLean, contritely suggesting a lunch to make up. Isaiah duly appeared, and McLean asked him. What he thought about、uh, Harry Wallace, Rosefall's left wing, left wing vice president. Isaiah said that he thought there might be a screw loose somewhere. McLean again exploded and defended Wallace as the champion of all that was、uh, decent and progressive. At which point Isaiah concluded that、uh, friendship with him was impossible. As with、uh, Burgess, he had not the slightest inkling that、uh, McLean was、uh, a spy, but the encounter remained in his mind as、uh, something more than an after-dinner disagreement. For his capacity to be relatively indifferent to someone's views, provided. That、uh, they had other redeeming virtues. In Alice Rutherford's long verse cases, case,、uh, cheerful aristocratic、uh, hauteur, a sharp mind, a voluminous memory for Washington lore and gossip, and above all, a vitality which seemed to Isaiah to redeem her awful political views. Ironically, he took the same view of、uh, McLean's associate, Burgess. That、uh, sheer appetite for life redeemed his、uh, solid love life and、uh, peculiar pol- political opinions. The Douglas、uh, Fairbanks、uh, deal, do with、uh, Donald McLean 
was one of the small events in which a liberal temperament received its、uh, baptism of fire. With the Allied invasion of Europe progressing towards inevitable victory and peace at last in sight, Arnold Tongby offered Berlin a post in the research department of the Foreign Office, but he recoiled from the death in life atmosphere of a cave of a frustrated professor. He、um, momentarily. Considered the idea of going to Paris as Ambassador Duff Cooper's press attaché. He had met Cooper's、uh, wife Diana in a air raid shelter in London during a visit home in 1942, and had fallen for her icy beauty and little wit. But he could see that Paris was a step down from、uh, Washington. Indeed. Whitehall was too. He regarded a foreign office career as a vegetarian diet after the satisfactions of a canoe wars feast at the center of a power. He tired of、uh, the weekly grind of the political summaries, telling a friend that he felt like an opera singer who had sung one too many mad scenes. But there was a more than just a fatigue in his、uh, growing restiveness at the embassy, working for a vigorously anti-Zionist, pro-Arab Arab foreign office, was both exhausting and depressing. He felt worn down by the inner battle with his own exuberant indiscreetness. Finally, he re- realized that he. Had a habit of seeing a pattern in the carpet, the larger shape of events, and that this was a intellectual's rather than a bureaucrat's case of mind, cast of mind. The weekly opinion summaries were confusing, were confining. He wanted to write with a bigger sweep. For all these reasons, therefore, he began to daydream. Of returning to New College, and the joke that he had in mind a vast work on European history, in at least twenty-four volumes, which、uh, would keep him occupied in blameless drudgery for the rest of his life. A chance encounter had met, had set him thinking hard about the future direction of his intellectual life. Some time early in 1944. He lunched at、uh, the Harvard Faculty Club with the mathematical logician Harry Schaeffer. Schaeffer was、uh, skating about the damage done to philosophy by the pseudo-scientific、uh, pretensions of、uh, logical positivism. Scientific progress, he insisted, was、uh, simply not possible in philosophical fields like.、Uh, Epistemology or ethics. To speak of a, a man learned in epistemology or a scholar in ethics, Isaiah remembered Schaeffer saying, does not make sense. It is not that kind of a study. Only in strictly deductive fields like、uh, logic, or in empirical fields like、uh, experimental psychology, was a、uh, Progress of a scientific sort possible. Isaiah actually found Schaeffer's、uh, condemnation of the logical positivism too sweeping, but he came away from the encounter with、uh, renewed doubts about、uh, returning to philosophy. In the spring of 1944, he found himself on an interminable transatlantic flight to London. In those days, the cabins were not pressurized, and、uh, travelers had to spend the long hours in the dark, breathing through an、uh, oxygen tube, unable to sleep, for fear that the tube would slip out of、uh, his mouth. Isaiah 
remained awake throughout the night in a dark, cold, joining aircraft, with nothing else to do but think. He always hated thinking alone, and the this journey was singularly disagreeable. He went over. With a shaver had said and began to see pure philosophy as a field, like a criticism or poetry, in which it was not possible to add to the store of a positive human knowledge. I gradually came to the conclusion, he later wrote, that I should prefer a field in which one could hope to know more at the end of one's life. Than one, one had begun. When he landed the next morning, rumpled and bleary, he had decided to leave philosophy for the history of ideas. He suggested to New College, where he had been teaching since 1938, that he would move into the history of philosophy. And proposed leaving ethics, logic, and epistemology to his friend Herbert Hart. Hart was an old Oxford friend from a Yorkshire Jewish family, but then married to another old friend, Jennifer Fisher Williams. He was the perfect choice to replace Isaiah at a new college. And、uh, duly did so in 1945. The other great Oxford philosophical figure of the 1930s, John Austin, had turned his、uh, formidable powers to managing the logistics for the D-Day landings. He was now due to return to Oxford, as was、uh, Stuart Hampshire, who had said. A equally distinguished career in military intelligence, who had had a equally distinguished career in military intelligence, deciphering encoded German signals traffic, he was now trying to secure a fellowship at a Balliol in order to resume his philosophical career. Isaiah urged Herbert Hart to contact Austin and Hampshire and put together the.、Um, Circle of the 1930s once again. As for Jennifer, who was、uh, giving up an、uh, important job at the Home Office, he warned Herbert that、uh, bringing a wife to Oxford is like、uh, bringing her to the cold coast. Conditions are colonial. It was now April 1945, and Berlin wanted to leave, but the headmaster. As he now called、uh, Lord Halifax behind his, his back, was、uh, unwilling to let him go back to academic life. On 12 April, Franklin Fr-、uh, Roosevelt died, and Isaiah was given was given the task of、uh, assessing for an、uh, anxious British government the momentous change that had occurred. The resulting dispatch was、uh, one of the most acute of Isaiah's career. Roosevelt was、uh, being eulogized in death. He observed, but in life he had been one of the most bitterly hated figures in America. His achievement, Berlin went on, had been to alter, perhaps, in perpetuity. The concept of the duties and the functions of the United States government in general and of the pre- presidency in particular. Turning to the future, he predicted that the main federal reforms of the New Deal would remain in place, even if the extent of government interference was、uh, reduced with the coming of a、uh, peace. The tradition of a positive action towards social welfare, which Roosevelt had initiated, would continue under Truman. The bootleg version released to Nicholas and the Ministry of Information was considerably 
more candid. The truth about the White House is that while Truman is clearly sincere, decent, and a liberal in a provincial Midwestern way, the best kind of American legionnaire, unexpectedly businesslike, brisk, crisp, and capable of getting on with people like Eden and Littleton, the whole thing is on such a minute skill, such a Dutch interior, that all these virtues cannot provide for the first really big crisis, which are general principles do not solve. Truman's predilection is quite simply for, uh, for respectable, unfrightening hacks. Maybe I ought to have been a piano player in a whore house and not president of the United States, he amiably observed to a friend of mine. Isaiah had wanted to go to San Francisco to join the British delegation at the conference establishing the United Nations that summer, but Halifax kept him in Washington drafting the weekly political summaries. In late May, however, he was flown after to assist the delegation with the Russian translation of the UN Charter. This work brought him into close contact with an old friend, Charles Chip Bolin, now U.S. liaison on the Russian draft of the Charter. Isaiah admired uh, Bolin's finely turned sensitivity to language. Bolin had been Roosevelt's personal translator and a note-taker since the Moscow Conference of 1943 and had set in on meetings between the big three. It was a Churchill who actually gave a Bolin most trouble as a translator. He was wont to throw out phrases like uh, the, death, the depth of a sublime on wisdom, which resisted any aversion in Russian. Bolin now enlisted Isaiah's help with a translation of the Charter. The two spent two weeks together in the Veterans Building in San Francisco, tossing Russian words back and forth, weighing their hidden connotations to be certain that the Soviets were not slipping some useful ambiguity into their choice of a treaty language. In the section dealings with the right of a member state to march its army through a second state in order to defend a third, Isaiah paused over the Russian word for passing through. He convinced Bolin that the Russian version implied a right not only to march through, but to stay if need be. When this was pointed out to the Soviets, they protested that the Soviet school children were already learning the proposed text by heart. It was too late to make any change. Isaiah and Bolin dug in their heels, and eventually the Soviets conceded the point. On another occasion, the Russian translation implied that all British mandated territories should be established forthwith. Isaiah insisted on a change of a wording, and the Bolin joked that Isaiah had saved the British Empire with a stroke of a pencil. Bolin was uh, sufficiently impressed to suggest to Halifax, as they flew back to Washington, that Isaiah be used again a further summit meetings with Stalin. Halifax agreed and recommended the Berlin's appointment as a translator for Anthony Eden at the forthcoming Potsdam Conference of the Allied Leaders. In early July, Isaiah flew to London to prepare. Privately, he was not much enamored of Eden and had been 
uh, her to refer to him behind his back as the Sleeping Beauty. For his part, Eden was not especially well disposed towards academics and uh, intellectuals, especially witty and uh, facetious ones. Days before, before his departure, the Foreign Office told Berlin that uh, he was not going to post them after all. It is possible, though Isaiah never found out for certain, that his remark about the sleeping beauty had caught up with him. His uh, disappointment about the post time was uh, severe but uh, short-lived, for a beguiling alternative had come his way. Eighteen months earlier, on a visit to Washington in January 1944, Archibald Clark Curl, the British ambassador in Moscow, had talked to Isaiah about a policy towards the Soviets. Casually, he suggested that Isaiah might like to come to Moscow and uh, have a look around. Isaiah leaped at the prospect. Clark Kerr asked uh, him when he would like to come. It was tonight. Clark Kerr laughed and said that he must have some conditions. No, Isaiah replied unconditional surrender. Clark Kerr returned to Moscow and the plan hung in the air for nearly 18 months. As Isaiah wrote to a friend, I felt like one of the forlorn provincial women in Chekhov's Three Sisters who keep saying, to Moscow, to Moscow. In May 1945, Clark Kerr reappeared in Washington on his way to the San Francisco conference. He renewed his uh, offer and convinced Isaiah that it was a genuine but a simple but a irresistible device of a weaving a visa in front of me. This time Isaiah did not repeat the mistakes of the Burgess affair. He made sure that the Foreign Office approved of a Clark Kerr's plan. By early June, it had been decided that he was to go to Moscow to prepare a long dispatch about American-Soviet-British relation in the post-war world. The dispatch was to be a grand affair. He ironically observed a reference point for all time. He was to be in Moscow until early 1946, when returned to Washington to draft, to draft his uh, report. It would be his uh, swan song, his uh, farewell area as a, a British official. In late July 1945, but then back in England, Isaiah spent the weekend with uh, Patricia Douglas at a country cottage she was uh, renting after the collapse of her marriage. On 26th July, they listened to the returns of the British general election on the radio and danced a jig on the lawn at the news of the labor landslide with a charming ingenuousness, which this time Isaiah found it possible to resist. She proposed a marriage. Extricating himself from this new phase of his entanglement with her, he boarded a plane for Berlin, and after a night in company with Neil Annan, Gorney Rees and other friends, then serving with the British intelligence in the ruins of the German capital, flew on to Moscow. He was in a state of high excitement. In a letter to his parents, he exclaimed, exclaimed in Russian, Chang do know about that? It will be wonderful. That's the end of our chapter 9, Isaiah's stay in Washington. The next chapter will be in Moscow.